Now we are entering into the second uh, part of today's event. And this is a panel discussion with uh, distinguished speakers. Now let me introduce briefly uh, uh, our distinguished speakers. First of all, I'd like to introduce Dr. Hans Kundunani. He is director uh, of European program at the Chatham House, the Royal Institute of International Affairs in the UK, and he will join in our discussion online. Thank you very much, Hans. <laughs> so you can hear me, right? Okay, thank you very yes. much. And then I'd like to introduce uh, Celine Pajon. Uh, she is currently head of Japan research at the Center for Asian Studies at French Institute of International Relations in Paris. And fortunately, she is with us here in this room. Thank you very much, Celine. And then I'd like to also introduce uh, our next speaker. And he is uh, Nithin Koka. And he is currently a free journalist in Tokyo, and based in Tokyo. And also, he is with us here. Thank you very much, Nithin. And then I'd like to introduce Professor Louis Shim. Professor Louis Shimon is a uh, calendary. Uh, he is currently director at the Center for Security, Diplomacy, and Strategy, CSDS, at the Free University of Brussels School of Governance. Thank you very much with us. And then, uh, finally, I'd like to introduce our director, uh, Kazuto Suzuki. Professor Kazuto Suzuki is currently, as I explained, director at the Institute of Geoeconomics and the uh, International House of Japan. And also, he is professor at uh, of uh, Glaje School of Public Policy at the University of Tokyo. Suzuki-san, thank you very much. So then I'd like to uh, uh, ask uh, Hans for your talk. Uh, Hans is uh, a, a co-reader, uh, a leader, a project reader with me and this research project on the future of liberal international order. And I suppose that he will provide us a kind of an outline on the introductory uh, uh, speech on how we think about liberal international order. So Hans, who is you, yours? Thank you very much, uh, Yuichi-san. And I'm really sorry that I can't be there with you in, in person uh, for this, apologies. Um, as as um, Yuichi-san said, I'll, I'll sort of do a little bit of an introduction to the project, outlining what we've been kind of discussing over the last uh, few months. Um, we have this great group of 10 scholars from around the world, partly from Europe and Japan, but also from, from other parts of the world, particularly from, from Asia. Um, and I guess what we've been sort of thinking about and, and this is very much a follow-up to the previous um, volume that um, Yuichi-san mentioned, um, thinking about uh, the United States and Japan and the liberal international order. This is focusing much more on Europe and Japan, but I guess we're looking at, I suppose, three slightly distinct um, uh, but connected kind of questions, really. Um, the first is around the liberal international order itself and the future of the liberal, in liberal international order. Um, the second um, is around the Indo-Pacific, um, the Indo-Pacific as a, as a kind of a region, and in particular thinking about how Europeans and J Japan might cooperate more closely in that region. Um, and I think the third aspect of this is um, the, the, the China challenge, um, you know, which obviously very much overlaps with the Indo-Pacific as a space, but, but not completely. Um, and again, thinking about how um, we might uh, have closer cooperation between Europeans and Japan as part of a broader uh, coalition to respond to the China challenge. Um, and for me, one of the interesting things about this project, one of the things I've learned um, from um, the discussions that we've had uh, among the group of, of scholars um, is that um, these things are all, these three things are all sort of closely connected, but quite distinct, as I say, but there, there are also different views about each of these three questions in different parts of the world, in particular, um, Europe, Japan, elsewhere in Asia, and the United States. Um, and so I'll say a little bit more about that, about some of those different ways of thinking about those questions in the countries that we have represented in our group. Um, and then a little bit about the war in Ukraine, which, you know, we began this project before the war in Ukraine began, 
Um, and I'll say a little bit about where the war in Ukraine sort of leaves uh, some of these questions around uh, cooperation between particularly Europe and Japan, but, but more broadly um, as well. So first of all, on the liberal international order, as I say, it's very striking to me um, that we, you know, we sort of use this term a lot, but actually I think we often have quite different ideas of, of what it means. Um, and um, it seems to me that there's probably sort of three different um, versions of it that have come out from the um, discussions that, that we've had. The first is, is one which, you know, a, an idea of liberal international order, which focuses very much on democracy. Um, that this is the liberal international order is, is a sort of pro-democratic um, uh, kind of order. Um, and that the sense in which it's liberal is that it favors democracy. Um, as I say, this I think is, is, is a view of the liberal international order that you get particularly in, in the United States, that the, the liberal international order is almost a sort of coalition of democracies, not quite, but almost. Um, the second um, is the idea of liberal international order as a rules-based order, that it's not necessarily about democracy as such, it's more about a set of rules which countries follow. Now, you know, some people would conflate those two different versions and sort of suggest that actually democracies have a tendency to follow the rules more than authoritarian states, but nevertheless, it's conceptually um, a little bit different. And I think the third sense of the liberal, in the liberal international order is um, around a sort of idea of economic liberalism, um, that this is about free trade um, and an open economic order. Um, and, as I say, I think you have different emphases in different places on different aspects of the order in, in that sense. Um, and one of the things I've been particularly struck by uh, thinking here, particularly about, about Europe and how it fits into this debate, is that a lot of Europeans, and Celine, I think, will probably talk more about, about France in particular, are quite uncomfortable with this idea of um, the liberal international order as a very pro-democracy order. Um, and Europeans in general, I think, are quite worried about this um, way in which the world is increasingly divided into, um, in a sort of bipolar kind of way, uh, between democracies on the one hand and authoritarian um, states um, on, on the other hand. And so Europeans, and particularly France and Germany, like to focus on the idea of following the rules rather than, uh, rather than on uh, democracy itself. Now, one of the things that's quite interesting, I think, is that the United States, which, as I mentioned, has tended to think more in terms of democracy, I think is slightly nuancing that, nuancing that position now. And um, uh, the, the national security strategy, which came out uh, you know, within the last um, week, is, is quite interesting in that respect, the, the language in relation to democracy, because um, it doesn't actually uh, divide the world into democracies and authoritarian states in a straightforward kind of way. Actually, it, it has a slightly more subtle uh, take on this, which is to say that actually the threat is not so much authoritarian states as such. It's, as it puts it, powers that layer authoritarian governance with a revisionist foreign policy. Um, in other words, it's not just authoritarian states as such, it's authoritarian states that export an illiberal model of international order, as, as the national security strategy puts it. And that, I think, is, is a way of responding to what some people call the sort of Vietnam question, right? You know, in, in order to maintain the liberal international order in the Indo-Pacific, there are some countries that aren't democracies like Vietnam that a country like Japan, I think, will want to cooperate with. Um, and so this is, I think, an attempt to try to sort of square that circle. But I think what all of this illustrates is, is the sort of complexity around the, con the concept of the liberal international order and how we have slightly different views um, of what the liberal international order even is in different parts um, of uh, in different parts of the world, even among democracies. So that brings me then to the question of the war in Ukraine and, and the way that it's sort of changed um, this whole debate about um, the liberal international order uh, and about what's going on in, in international politics, and in particular where it leaves sort of the idea of cooperation between Europe and Japan uh, on maintaining the liberal international order or, uh, you know, an approach to the Indo-Pacific or responding to the China challenge. Um, and I guess, again, it's quite complicated, or there are two different 
I guess, countervailing forces that seem to be operating. The first is that I guess the, 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 the sort of initial immediate response, I think, of Europeans to the war in Ukraine has been to focus very much on Europe um, and to sort of narrow, in a sense, um, uh, the European uh, perspective on some of these questions. Um, until the war began, um, Europeans were, I think, beginning to think about uh, making a greater contribution to security in the Indo-Pacific than they had previously done. Um, led, I think, by France and the UK, the two um, leading European military powers, also permanent members of the Security Council, but also two powers that I think are slightly positioned a little bit differently um, in uh, the Indo-Pacific than other European countries because of their history, uh, as well as, as I say, that ongoing role that they have as security providers um, globally. Um, there was a sense that um, Europeans needed to make more of a contribution to security in the Indo-Pacific. Um, but there was obviously a question of resources, um, and uh, this is something that Europeans, I think, were struggling with. I think the immediate effect of the war in Ukraine has been to create the sense that now Europeans can't afford that anymore um, and have to focus even more narrowly on European security than they had previously um, done. Um, at the same time, though, I think there's a sort of countervailing uh, a tendency, which is the increasing sense that security in the Indo-Pacific and security in the Euro-Atlantic are connected. And I think Lewis may be uh, going to say some more about this, about those connections. Um, I think that's also something that Europeans are gradually starting to, um, to grasp. Um, and part of that is also because of the perception, correctly or, or not, that China and Russia are becoming closer to each other, more closely aligned. Um, and that actually the war in Ukraine is a significant moment in that, um, in that alignment between China and, and Russia. So I think where that sort of leaves Europeans is a sense that um, they sort of want to do more in the Indo-Pacific and sort of see that they ought to, but are struggling to figure out how they might do that given the resource constraints that they're under. And all I'll really say on, on that, and I'm sure we'll get into this more in the, in the discussion is, but I think there are, um, there, are, there are ways of thinking about how a division of labor here might work between Europeans. Um, because um, if you look at Germany, uh, where there's been this big um, increase in defense spending since the war in Ukraine began, um, there's been this debate about whether, you know, the shift in German Russia policy ought to also lead to a shift in German-China policy, that in a sense, Germany ought to learn some lessons from the war in Ukraine for its approach um, to China. Um, and there's a big debate going on about that in, in Germany. Um, in the last couple of days, some of this has focused on um, the, um, the attempt by Chinese company Costco to buy uh, part of the port of Hamburg um, with some security implications. Um, and the instinct of the Chancellor Olaf Scholz um, seems to be to sort of resist the idea of decoupling uh, from, from China. And I think that's a broader kind of European uh, 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 instinct as well, to try to avoid this uh, bifurcation of the world into two um, separate, uh, separate blocks. Um, I think part of the solution to this might be a, a kind of a, a division of labour between Europeans where, um, as I mentioned, France and the UK, which have a different kind of interest, I think, in, in Asian security than other European countries like Germany. Um, if, if Germany is willing to take a greater role in European security, particularly in terms of providing conventional uh, military capabilities, um, in other words, um, if the German Seiten vendor, as it's sometimes called, uh, really becomes a reality, then I think that would allow France and the UK to continue to play a role in, in, in security in the Indo-Pacific. Um, but that's perhaps something that we can get into um, more in, in, in the discussion. So let me just stop there. And um, uh, as, as I to, just to summarize, I, I, I think this, this is a sort of very complex set of, of issues that we're looking at. Um, the um, the liberal international order, the Indo-Pacific, the China challenge, um, and then within that, you know, how Europeans and, and, and Japan might uh, cooperate more closely as part of a, a broader coalition um, and I think the war in Ukraine has sort of created new challenges, um, but it 
also has, I think has created some new opportunities for us to think about how we might um, we might make that coalition happen. Well, thank you very much indeed, Hans, for your brilliant talk. As a first panelist, you raised nearly all the important points about what we should think about the future of liberal international order, particularly in the Indo-Pacific. And so you provided us so many uh, food for thought. Maybe we will touch upon some of the issues afterwards. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And then I'd like to move to Luis Simon. I will follow the same order. And if you may, uh, if I may, I'd like to ask you to talk about your view on the future of liberal international order. Thanks, Yuichi. It's a pleasure to be here. And I, I want to be brief. I, I want to make a few points about the, the links between the Euro-Atlantic and Indo-Pacific, sort of building on my chapter. But I also would like to come back later to some of the points that uh, Hans made. I think he... Uh, he made some excellent observations, not least in relation to the division of labor, and I'd like to come back to that later, because I, I actually very much agree with, uh, uh, with the way he, he, he framed it. Um, so um, the, 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 the U.S., and, and Hans was also talking about the U.S. national security strategy that was published a couple of uh, weeks ago, as you all know, and at, it includes plenty of references to the growing strategic interdependence between the uh, Euro-Atlantic and Indo-Pacific and the link to build bridges between uh, 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 U.S. allies in both regions, and that sort of that interdependence is, uh, according to the national security strategy, is justified on a number of counts. Uh, at the top of the list is growing cooperation between China and Russia, and again, uh, uh, Hans touched on that, uh, which apparently compels uh, America's allies in Europe and, and Asia to sort of match up uh, in terms of their own coordination. The interdependence narrative is also ideologically appealing, uh, in the sense that the United States and its treaty allies in the Euro-Atlantic and Indo-Pacific. Uh, uh, are presented as the global spearhead of democracy and the so-called international order, uh, liberal international order. Uh, this interdependence narrative has also found its way onto NATO statements. You could see it with a strategic concept in Madrid, uh, but also into statements uh, uh, related to the EU's uh, 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 or Europe's more broadly engagement in the Indo-Pacific. There are a lot of references to interdependence and you know connectivity and so on. Uh, and I think America's Indo-Pacific allies have also bought into that narrative, and, uh, uh, and this is illustrated in Japan's, Australia's, and, and Korea's uh, support and statements of support of transatlantic sanctions against Russia and their appeals to defending the international order in Europe. You know, Prime Minister Kishida's uh, references to uh, uh, today's Ukraine being tomorrow's Asia. But isn't interdependence exaggerated? Aren't we overplaying the interdependence narrative? Uh, Ashley Townshend uh, uh, a few weeks ago was saying that U.S. references to strategic links between the Euro-Atlantic and Indo-Pacific are rhetorical, that they are not proven, and they actually stand on the way of a much-needed exercise in establishing priorities and, 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 and some sort of hierarchy. And other scholars have actually uh, uh, said the same. And in fact, if you look at international relations scholarship, uh, uh, actually, there is a consensus in the literature that regions are the most relevant units uh, and, uh, uh, of analysis in international security. And this is because security threats travel much more easily over short distances than over long distances. Uh, and that means that the degree of security interdependence is much more intense between actors within one region than, than it is between actors inside that region and those outside. And I think those considerations actually are relevant today. In fact, uh, even, even though the U.S. national security strategy uh, admits that competition with China is global, it also says that its epicenter is in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, uh, partly contradicting or at least nuancing uh, that global interdependence narrative. Uh, and it, if we actually look past public diplomacy statements and rhetoric, uh, it actually seems that most U.S. allies, both in the Euro-Atlantic and Indo-Pacific, agree with this with this approach. Uh, NATO may pay lip service uh, to a global approach to security and to the importance of the Indo-Pacific and the Indo-Pacific being a big deal, but actually most European allies continue to insist that the Atlantic Alliance is first and foremost a regional operation and have clear red lines uh, about uh, any commitments out of area. Uh, likewise, while most Asian allies may affirm their support of a global rules-based order, I think their chief concern relates to China's ability to upend the balance of power in, in, in East Asia, and for good reasons. Everything else is secondary. It's there, but it's secondary. Uh, so it's therefore hard to disagree with uh, criticisms uh, of the interdependence thesis. Um, Indeed, the first concern of America's Indo-Pacific and European allies is with their respective regions, not least 
given the presence of revisionist powers uh, uh, at their doorsteps. Uh, it's true that regions are not silos and, uh, and that there are indeed direct security links between both regions. Think of China's global military reach, uh, 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 its advances in cyberspace, ICBMs, which are domains that are not necessarily confined to any particular region, uh, its investment in the Blue Water Navy, growing presence in the Mediterranean, the Baltic or the Black Sea, and NATO has taken good note of that. Uh, these are relevant developments for Europeans, but I think they remain of secondary strategic importance. Uh, Russia is perhaps a slightly different case because it has territory and military bases uh, uh, in both Europe and East Asia, and that makes it perhaps particularly relevant for a country like Japan. However, uh, Russia's specific presence uh, remains a very secondary issue for most uh, Indo-Pacific uh, Indo uh, countries. So we could therefore argue that, well, there are a number of direct links between the Euro-Atlantic and, and the Indo-Pacific, they are not that consequential strategically. However, and this is my, my main point, it is actually indirect links between both regions that matter most. And I would highlight three points in particular. The first is that the deterrence and security architecture of both Europe and the Indo-Pacific revolves around the same factor, US military power. The second is that the, uh, the US devotes a much higher share of its defense resources to Europe and the Indo-Pacific than it devotes to the rest of the world. And the third is that US defense resources are limited and that the gap between the U US defense resources and that of the rest of the world is decreasing. So while the US uh, acknowledges the existence, uh, uh, I mean, whether the US explicitly acknowledges the existence of strategic and force trade-offs between the Euro-Atlantic and the, and the Indo-Pacific, these trade-offs are very real. And it doesn't matter if the national security strategy doesn't want to grapple with that. Uh, uh, in the sense that what the US does in one region impinges on its ability to, to resource deterrence uh, in the other region. Uh, um, and, and, and of course, the US over prioritizing one region opens or and deprioritizing the other op can open windows for uh, opportunistic aggression. Um, and, and of course, the, the importance that the U.S. affords to Europe and to East Asia traditionally, if we look at debates on U.S. grand strategy, is because uh, allegedly these are the only two regions in the world that, that, uh, that, that, that hold sufficient economic, technological, and industrial resources uh, to allow any power that dominates them to mount a serious challenge to the U.S. and to the international order, right? Um, so that assumption, that, that means that preserving a balance of power, ensuring that no single power dominates either region, is a core principle for US grand strategy. Um, and, and the assumption is that the balance of power in both Europe and the Indo-Pacific is structurally delicate, and that requires permanent US engagement. Uh, um, but to what extent does that assumption hold today? In other words, how fragile are the actually the regional balances of Europe and East Asia? Well, I, I would say that uh, uh, um, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't quite hold the assumption, at least not today. Uh, certainly, uh, rising China poses a serious and cross-domain military, economic, technological uh, threat to the regional balance in East Asia, but the same cannot be said of Europe. Even though it may be premature to draw too many lessons uh, from Russia's military performance in Ukraine, it, its seeming difficulties to hold on to its early gains in the South, in the East, uh, and high rate of equipment loss raise questions about Russia's ability uh, to even pose a conventional military threat uh, uh, to, uh, to NATO. Uh, and to this, we must add Russia's growing economic and political isolation in Europe. And I think the, the NSS, uh, in fact, recognizes this uh, as it identifies Russia as an acute threat, sharp, near term, uh, potentially transitory, and localized. And China as the pacing challenge that can bring together a comprehensive suit of power and is regional or even global. I think this, this distinction is very relevant uh, in the sense that Moscow can definitely threaten uh, US allies in Eastern Europe, but it's not in a position to upset the European balance of power, uh, let alone the global one, whereas China can, China is. So we, we can argue, and I think you, you've got more and more people in the US arguing this, that the United States uh, and its allies face a balance of power problem in East Asia and a stability problem in Europe. These are problems of a different magnitude, and that puts Asia on a much higher level uh, uh, strategically. And in fact, I think it's interesting, US Secretary of Defense uh, Lloyd Austin recently argued that the United States wanted to see Russia weakened 
to the degree that it cannot do the kinds of things that it has done in invading Ukraine. I think this 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 point is very relevant because by substantially weakening Russia, the ex this, the existence of a threat to the balance uh, of power in Europe could be neutralized at least for the foreseeable future, and that could actually set the foundations for the U.S. to redirect the bulk of its national security resources towards the pacing challenge. Uh, so in other words, and contrary to what many people have been arguing in the States, dealing with the Russian threat decisively uh, and degrading Russian uh, military power is, is probably the best way to pave the path for a proper rebalance to the, to the Indo-Pacific. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that and then come back to uh, hopefully some points on division of labor and what that means for division of labor. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Luis, uh, for your brilliant uh, articulation of how the two theaters, European theater and Asian theater, are interlinked together, particularly by focusing on the importance of indirect nature of the link between the two. And we now can understand much deeper on the nature of the current international relations by focusing on the two regions. Thank you very much indeed. Then i like to move on to Celine's part on her contribution to our volume. Thank you very much, Yuchi. Thank you so much for including me in this uh, great project and for having me today back in Tokyo. <laughs> After three years, I'm very happy to be, uh, to be among you. Um, so, uh, because I'm from Paris, I will focus on France, <laughs> zooming on the French um, strategy uh, in the Indo-Pacific and uh, show you the link between uh, the Indo-Pacific strategy and uh, um, France objective to uphold the rules-based uh, order and try to discuss uh, the recent development with uh, AUKUS, uh, war in Ukraine and, and so on and what this, it means. So um, I indeed argue that uh, upholding the rules-based order is a significant objective of the French Indo-Pacific strategy that was uh, unveiled back in 2018. Uh, because the Indo-Pacific is a key uh, area where international norms are being challenged today, as you know, and where the future world order shaped by, by the US-China rivalry is at play. So uh, France uh, should, should have a role in the region. Also, because as you know, France is a resident power uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, it has overseas territories uh, and uh, citizens, both in the Indian and, uh, and Pacific oceans, and a very large EEZ. So it's very important also to protect uh, their interest. So the preservation of the rules-based order uh, participate in shaping a favorable geostrategic order for France and relate to France's national interest in the region, as well as to Paris' universalist ambition. And here I would like to quickly highlight uh, two main drivers for, uh, for France to, to set up this Indo-Pacific strategy. I think the first driver is a response to, to China and Chinese uh, maritime expansion uh, in the region, as well as a Belt and Road uh, initiative that posed a certain amount of, of risk and uh, to the extent that the, the strategic review uh, in France uh, seen uh, I've seen the, the Chinese rise as uh, a, a prominent risk um, and a, a, a disruptive uh, factor uh, in, in the region. Um, and the second driver is actually Macron, President Macron's values-based uh, diplomacy, because uh, since its arrival to, to power back in 2017, Macron made clear that he wanted to restore uh, France's global influence by upholding its values and principles and for Paris to be a central player for uh, global governance and multilateralism. So what some people call the doctrine Macron is based on a deep sense of crisis uh, uh, regarding the, the world order. So in one of his first speech, he highlighted, and here I quote, we see that we have a crisis with a multilateral framework of 1945, a crisis in terms of its effectiveness, uh, effectiveness sorry, but, and it is even more serious, in my opinion, a crisis in terms of the universality of the values upheld by its structure. Uh, so you can see that's a really core uh, concern for, 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 for France and for the President Macron. And um, in his view, Russia and China are clearly identified uh, as revisionist power, 
And uh, Macron has repeatedly underlined, especially during its visit to, to France territories uh, in the Indo-Pacific, the risk of a Chinese uh, hegemony and predatory moves uh, into the region. So when we look at um, French Indo-Pacific approach, the, the value uh, dimension, so to say, uh, should be understood broadly. Um, as the promotion of the international law uh, and a democratic process emphasized first at the interstate uh, level. Uh, it means that France is uh, um, it's supporting a uh, form of, uh, of multilateralism, uh, effective multilateralism, so a kind of democratic process of, of making decisions between the countries. Um, and this is a um, focus made rather than um, democracy at the, at the domestic level, if you will. Because, of course, France is uh, it's, uh, upholding the, the, the democratic uh, values, but is um, advocating a more uh, inclusive approach, uh, I mean, as, at federating a, a maximum of, of like-minded partners. So. Um, to have um, countries who may not check all the, uh, you know, the boxes of, uh, of the full uh, democracy, but uh, sharing some interests is, uh, is very important too, and, and we can discuss that uh, later regarding uh, the, the, the position of, of Southeast Asian countries uh, and so much. Um, at the core of uh, France's principle-based approach in the Indo-Pacific, uh, are the freedom of uh, maritime and aerial circulation and the respect of, of international law, uh, especially at sea. And France have been uh, demonstrating its uh, attachment to the freedom of, of navigation uh, by uh, sending and dispatching uh, ships very regularly every year uh, to the, the South uh, China Sea uh, and so on. So I'd like to really concretely support this, uh, the, this principle. Um, another key feature of, of uh, France uh, approach in the region um, is uh, the concept of a strategic autonomy and France uh, acting as a balancing uh, power uh, in, in the region. Um, to, to understand this, uh, you have to get that Paris have been uh, quite uncomfortable with uh, first uh, President Trump uh, endorsement of the of free uh, and open Indo-Pacific strategy who was uh, very Sinocentric, uh, military based and quite confrontational. Um, so instead, France is promoting an independent and inclusive uh, strategy, reflecting a slightly different vision, I think, of what should be a stable uh, rule-based order. Uh, so rather that, um, than upholding a continued US dominance, France supports a multipolar order. And I know that uh, this, uh, uh, <coughs> this is um, raising some, uh, some issue or discussion sometime with our uh, Asian uh, partners because uh, China is also advocating a multipolar world, but I, I don't think we put the same <laughs> kind of concept be be behind this, uh, this world. Um, so, uh, um, President Macron really emphasized that France should be a, a, a balancing power, so uh, allied with the US, but not aligned uh, with it, and um, trying to offer an alternative uh, out of the, of the bipolar confrontation uh, between, uh, between China and US that he sees very much also as a destabilization destabilizing uh, factors uh, in, in the region. So this um, position uh, is quite uh, relevant when you see uh, the, how um, the countries in, uh, in Southeast Asia uh, are also uh, trying to, to hedge uh, uh, against both, uh, both uh, uh, the US and China and trying to, to advocate their, their own way. But at the same time, I, I feel that uh, there was three uh, recent developments that put uh, this, uh, this uh, attitude under, under pressure and, and in difficulty. First, we got the AUKUS, so the, the agreement, uh, the defense agreement between, uh, between the US, uh, Australia, and the UK. Uh, and this showed, uh, in a way, that um, 
not being aligned <laughs> with the U.S. as some um, uh, uh, some uh, um, kind of backlash, um, um, and it uh, it caused a deep uh, sense of of trust uh, cri crisis of trust uh, between France and this. Uh, Partners, um, the, the the war in Ukraine also uh, when uh, the the U.S. Uh, support is uh, really uh, now key, and uh, we are working closely uh, with with the U.S. on this, and also the rising tension in the Taiwan Strait was also pushing uh, France and and the European to to take a, a position. Uh, so, somehow and to 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 make their their positioning more more explicit, and I think we should really um, make an effort on this because the strategic autonomy and being a balancing power is often interpreted as a sign of wavering uh, commitment to the Indo-Pacific, or as a sign of uh, having an equidistant positioning between the U.S. and China. And of course, uh, it's not. Uh, it's not at all uh, about this. Um, so I think Paris must be clear that it shares wa Washington's core values, but wishes to, to, to keep some room of maneuvers vis-a-vis -vis, uh, certain U US choices driven by interest Paris might not share. Um, and I think in this way, we, we have a lot to do with, uh, with Japan, because although Japan has uh, this uh, really strong uh, alliance with the U.S. It has its own interest, indeed, and uh, and it might not be comfortable with all the the, the, the choices uh, the U.S. Uh, is uh, is making, especially under the, the Trump administration. And we don't know uh, what the future will be uh, after the, the Biden administration. So we really need to to think deeply uh, about what kind of uh, option we have. And another um, key uh, challenge that uh, that. I see is uh, how to, to deal with Southeast Asian countries and, and other countries that we saw uh, in the world uh, that do not want to, to choose uh, really uh, a side between the US uh, uh, and, uh, and, and China or, or, or really, um, you know, sanction uh, Russia or, or be against, uh, against Russia. That's a, that's a very big uh, challenge for, for us all. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Celine, for sharing your view on uh, French role in the Indo-Pacific, because France has been always an important player in the region, so that's why we should not exclude the importance of French role and the French uh, strategy in the region, how France has been trying to contribute to the peace and prosperity in the region. Thank you very much indeed. Then I'd like to move on to uh, Nathan Coca. Uh, Nathan Coca is a freelance journalist and he, uh, I would like to have your view on how you and the Southeast Asian countries have been seeing the current trend in the, in, well, in the Pacific region. Great, thank you very much. I prepared actually a short presentation to accompany my talk. Um, so I'm going to focus specifically because there's a lot of things we can discuss on Southeast Asia, but specifically, I think, is the power of Chinese economic coercion in the region and how that impacts the international rules, the uh, liberal international order. Um, and focus specifically on the role of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, I think that the Belt and Road Initiative has played a key role in why democratization and progress on growing regional institutions like ASEAN have stalled over the past two decades. And I think if we want to be able to engage Southeast Asia more and South ASEAN countries more, uh, to be more involved in the United Nations, to be more willing to sanction or be play a role in countering Russia or Chinese influence, uh, we need to figure out a way to reduce the threat of economic coercion. Um, so go to the next slide, please. So I, I wanted to start with this, uh, the vote that took place a few weeks ago at the United Nations Human Rights Council uh, around the whether to start a debate on the human rights situation in, the, in Xinjiang, in China, uh, where the homeland of the Uyghurs. And I think it was very clear looking at the vote that there was basically three groups of countries. There was developed Western and Asian democracies, mostly supporting uh, the debate. Um, there was allies of Taiwan, which are three countries on here, but also <coughs> voted yes. And then you have uh, countries that are part of the Belt and Road Initiative, including several countries in the Middle East, Muslim majority countries, um, Southeast Asian countries that all either voted to abstain or voted no. Uh, and they won 
And I think this shows a real problem of the Chinese influence in institutions like the United Nations, especially the Human Rights Council, which until recently was kind of a place that was more uh, a place for more valid debate between Europe and the United States that has really been uh, beholden to a lot of countries being voted on and being entered due to Chinese influence. The surprise to me in this chart was that Indonesia voted no. And historically, Indonesia is a country that tends to t you know, really value the fact that it's a non member of the non-aligned movement. Uh, it doesn't take a side on key political issues. It often votes to abstain on a lot of key United Nations votes at the General Assembly, but also on the Human Rights Council. But in this case, they were willing to take a position on the side of China. Um, so go to the next slide, please. And the reason was this because Indonesia saw a direct risk to Chinese investments. Uh, and that's why when we spoke to, when we was asked about it, why they didn't want to stand up to China, even on an issue um, related to, issue that should be of relevance to the world's largest Muslim majority country. And a country that has actually spoken up for Palestinians and Rohingya in different settings, but will not do the same thing for, for around Xinjiang. And I think one of the reasons that Indonesia uh, takes this position is because they clearly remember what happened to Australia back in 2020. Um, go to the next slide. Uh, when China, when Australia made a call and got into a fallout with China over the COVID-19 pandemic and the origins of the pandemic, China res responded by cutting imports of several Chinese goods to, us, to, in, to Australia, or to China from Australia. Indonesia was a key beneficiary because Indonesian coal exports jumped when Australian exports fell. This is just one part of the story is Indonesia benefited, but I think the bigger part of the story is how other countries also benefited. So next slide. And that includes the United States. The United States also saw exports of wine, cotton, timber, and wood increase to China. And this is a country that's considered a close ally of Australia. So it was very clear, I think, from a perspective like that, you, can, you face a lot of harm if you stand against China, but if you stand on the side of the West and stand outside the US or stand along with the European countries, you don't get much benefit. So there's a clear, I think it's clearly easy to see why Southeast Asian countries are not willing to stand on the side of countries like Japan, the US, Europe, because there has, there's, not a, there's not a clear case that they're, we're gonna be standing up for them or supporting them economically uh, when they face these kind of threats such as what happened to Australia. So uh, next slide. So the Chinese economic coercion is, I think it got a lot of attention in Australia, but it's actually been something that's been taking place for at least a decade. Uh, Turkey uh, faced economic coercion and trade sanctions and kind of risk of losing investment when they spoke up about the Uyghur issue back in 2009. Uh, South Korea faced it when they applied the deployment of US missiles a couple of years ago and saw tourism from China and investment drop dramatically over a couple of years. Uh, tourism is an interesting tool. Um, kind of reflects how China has a lot of mechanisms to, do, to utilize for economic coercion uh, that other countries lack. Uh, pineapples is a recent one. Taiwan saw the export, uh, import, export of pineapples from Taiwan to China blocked, uh, I think last year, uh, because of statements made by the Taiwanese president. Um, and I think Southeast Asia is in the center, and I don't, as a developing region, there is a, that's the key trading partner, the number one trading partner with China, uh, there isn't much space to be willing to take the risk that even a small expert like pineapples, it has a lot of political risk for leaders in those countries. Um, and these are economically fragile, economically fragile regions. There's also, I think, a corruption risk because a lot of the interests in industries such as coal, gas, and other things that are being exported to China, such as palm oil, are also closely connected to government officials in those regions. So there's less incentive to be able to take that risk because it would hurt their own business interests, potentially. Um, so Southeast Asian nations, I think, in general, they're willing to accept Chinese investment um, because there's another part of the argument, because with the exception of Japan, there hasn't really been a viable alternative when you're specifically looking at infrastructure and energy. Um, that's why despite active military encroachments by China into Vietnamese or Philippine, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, and even Brunei's territorial waters, and quite often we're starting to see even in the airspace, uh, they're not willing, there's not a big pushback, um, except in isolated cases, and there definitely is not a pushback from a regional perspective. There hasn't been any action, very little action, especially in recent years, uh, by ASEAN or by countries that stand up for their neighbors. Um, I think this is really worrying because Southeast Asia is at the center of the Indo-Pacific, or uh, one of the key regions, uh, the center of several trading routes. Um, and I think creating mechanisms to counter the impact of Chinese corrosive capital 
and at the Belt and Road Initiative, it's going to be key in countering Chinese influence in the region and the threat this holds for the rules-based international liberal order. So next slide, please. So I'm, I'm happy to see there's some interesting action on this. So at the G7 uh, earlier this year, uh, it was announced that Japan, Europe, and the United States would, would create this partnership for global infrastructure and investment. And it's specifically designed or meant to counter the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and I think Japan in particular, you know, I have some key questions here, but I think Japan in particular has a really interesting role to play because, uh, next slide, uh, Japan has been really active in Southeast Asia, unlike Europe and unlike United States, especially on infrastructure and energy projects. I think in 2015, uh, the big battle between China and Japan for the high-speed rail project between, between Bandung and Jakarta in Indonesia got a lot of attention when Indonesia chose China over Japan. Uh, I think it's an interesting juxtaposition that at the same time Japan was chosen to develop an MRT rail project in the capital of Jakarta. The Japanese MRT rail project was successful. It was finished on time. It was showcased in the presidential election because the president, Joko Widodo, was able to use it to show like, his ability to bring infrastructure to Indonesia. While the Chinese project is four years late, it's over budget, it's run into a lot of issues with land acquisition and other different types of challenges, it's kind of, it's, hopefully it will be finished next year, but it's been a bit of a mess. Um, so Japan has, uh, and when I ask people when I travel in Southeast Asia, like, what do you think of Japanese investment versus Chinese investment? They have a much po or positive view of Japanese investment. They see Japan, Japanese investment having less corruption, being able to be finished, keep the Japanese keep their promises, or the Japanese developers keep their promises. They use local labor. Uh, a key issue with Chinese projects is that they import Chinese labor, and that causes kind of local conflicts. Uh, but it's not perfect. There are specific instances where Japanese projects have also had environmental or social concerns. But I think overall, it's, uh, it's one of the reasons that Japan has, compared to Europe and the US, really high levels of favorability across almost all of Southeast Asia. Um, and I think it's because of the relationship Japan, Japan and Japanese companies have built over the last several decades. Uh, but on the, on, the criti criti on the critical side, Japan is offering an alternative choice, but not an alternative model. Um, and what I mean by that is it's being driven mostly by business interests, and it's not really necessarily increasing the chances of the countries to be more democratic or respect human rights. And I wonder if the G7 initiative, um, if the global, for if the global, um, the new global initiative can do that. And I'm also curious how well Japan, which is usually doing these projects bilaterally, working directly with countries, can Japan work with Europe? Can Japan work with the United States? How will that cooperation look? Um, in Japan, with this unique expertise, can helpfully, you know, helpful, hopefully level the playing field or allow investment from Europe and Japan to have, or Europe and America to have a bigger impact in Southeast Asia. Uh, so next slide. So I just have some questions like how, how can the BRI alternative, uh, a Western G7 BRI alternative, can it actually like counter economic coercion? Um, and how would it do that in an institutionalized way? Can it promote liberal values? Um, can, is there a space? I would recommend there to be like, you know, minimum standards for engaging civil society, uh, free, pri free prior and informed consent, uh, you know, having labor standards, and environmental standards that, that really show that this is very different than the BRI. This is, a pro this is going to provide better jobs, better economic development, and more sustainable development than what China is offering. Make a clear differentiation, because I think at this current stage, there is not that clear differentiation between investment coming from Europe, US, or Japan, and, and from China. And then I'm curious, like integrating with the existing uh, liberal international order, um, role of the existing institutions like the World Bank, and also like we've seen this with Sri Lanka, uh, a debt crisis that's caused a horrific pol political and economic crisis and devastating lives. Is there a way to make sure that investment coming from different regions can counter that or provide an alternative to that so that those risks are lessened uh, in the future? Um, and then I'll just the last slide. Please, next slide. I want to see more of this. So this is one of the few examples I found of effective, of effective countering of economic coercion. Uh, when Taiwan's pineapple exports were blocked, uh, former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe posted this on Twitter. It went viral in Taiwan. There was a surge in interest in people buying Taiwanese pineapples in different countries in Asia. Uh, and actually, apparently, didn't the impact that China wanted on the pineapple industry in Taiwan was limited. Um, this is. Great from a political perspective uh, as a political act by the former prime minister, uh, but it wasn't institutionalized. So how can something like this be institutionalized? How can 
countries support each other when they're facing Chinese economic corrosion? How can institutions be set up in a way to blunt that risk and then give space for countries to be able to speak up on issues like the Uyghur human rights crisis or be able to take a position in Southeast Asia? Because I think at this point, um, what we're doing, there's not a space for the countries to be able to take that economic risk. And until there's a way to counter that, I don't think you're going to see them take that economic risk. And it's going to be challenging for the US, Europe, and Japan to engage these countries on, uh, on issues like China and Russia and the rise of China. So um, that's all. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed for sharing your variable viewpoint of Southeast Asian countries. I think that it is really important, so that's why I'm glad that we can share your view on that. And finally, I'd like to ask Suzuki-san on his view on this question. All right, um, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to um, uh, thank all of you to, um, to join this project, uh, which is uh, also uh, hosted by the Institute of Geoeconomics, which I am the director of. And uh, I am very happy that uh, you know, we are able to uh, to provide an opportunity to discuss about uh, the real meaning of the liberal international order and what will be the next. Um, I think when we talk about the future of the liberal international order, uh, one of the uh, things that I'm interested in and, uh, and focusing on is the uh, concept of economic security, uh, which is uh, kind of overlapping with uh, uh, Nissin's uh, uh, presentation. Um, I think there are Nissin has um, has uh, demonstrated a lot of uh, uh, individual cases uh, like pineapple from Taiwan or you know the uh, BRI uh, the messy situation on BRI project in uh, Indonesia, and I think um, <clears throat> what I'm trying to do is that uh, to in order to look for the future of the liberal international order. We need to understand what uh, liberal international order is, and I think uh, uh, Hans already mentioned and uh, and and, and clarify there are uh, a variety of interpretation of the liberal international order, but uh, from the econ uh, from the economic security perspective, I think the liberal international order comes down to the question of the principles of the free trade, the free trade, and uh, you know the. GATT, IMF, uh, or Bretton Woods system that you might call it, um, is has been the uh, initially uh, intended to be the international order, but um, it actually uh, ended up as the Western uh, economic order. So that has been the sort of a misunderstanding and mistaken uh, of how the liberal international, what is the economic liberal international order? And the, because this, the, the reason why I'm saying this is because when the, uh, the Soviet Union collapsed and the uh, Tiananmen Square happened and uh, everyone is now being integrated into the, you know, the Russia, uh, China has applied for the WTO and being a member of the WTO, which is uh, quite a change of the, what, does it mean for what what it means for the economic liberal international order because uh, during the Cold War before the collapse of Soviet Union the concept of liberal international order was basically about the Western uh, international order which means that there were a very close connection between the politics and the economy so uh, during 1980s, there was a very severe uh, trade friction between Japan and the United States, but it ended up as the, uh, um, you know, Japan has conceded to the United States and to, uh, to finalize the, some sort of a landing point uh, for, the, for maintaining the liberal international order because Japan United States are the uh, allies, and uh, they are facing. Uh, they didn't have the uh, uh, a gap between the values and the norms, and they they share the common enemies. So, uh, but after the collapse of Soviet Union, the entrance of Russia and China in the liberal economic liberal international order, which means the membership of the WTO, means that we are now having the um, <coughs> the countries which doesn't share the same values and norms uh, 
uh, in the liberal international order. And in fact, the problem is that there was an expectation in the early 1990s when the, the you know, Soviet Union collapsed and uh, China was struggling to, uh, to, uh, uh, with uh, international isolation. Um, the, uh, we expected that the including uh, Russia and China into the liberal economic liberal international order will probably change their course of actions and, uh, and, the, econo uh, and the political system. So that there was an expectation that, you know, if the China and Russia become richer and uh, the middle, uh, middle class got bigger and uh, they start to demand more uh, political freedom and, you know, uh, it, it's, it's a typical, you know, the French Revolution scheme that, you know, the, the modernization will take place in uh, sort of, a, uh, you know, introducing a market economy and then, uh, uh, and it associated with uh, uh, democracy. And under this uh, assumption, um, you know, we have intended to engage in the economic interaction and interdependence with Russia and China. China became a, a, a world factory and the Russia is providing the you know rich mineral resources, uh, natural resources to to Europe mainly, and uh, there was a there was a few uh, 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 doubts that uh, you know connecting the Russian gas to uh, to the supply of the European gas is most effective and economic economically rational, and it is the most uh, you know uh, most reasonable choice. Uh, for for Europe and for the for the global economy, but nevertheless, I think this has changed, and we had to recognize uh, when uh, in in, in uh, uh, after the uh, crisis in the 2008, when the subprime loan crisis happened in 2008, and uh, you know um, the the financial crisis made it impossible for the um, Japan uh, and United States and Europe and the Western countries to get out of this uh, um, uh, mess. And uh, Japan is still making this uh, very low uh, in interest rate uh, policy. Um, so um, even after 12 years or 14 years, um, the, uh, the economic struggle continued. Meanwhile, the Russia and China were the first ones to uh, to escape from the economic crisis, and they become more confident of their uh, state capitalism and uh, their understanding of this control over the very strong uh, uh, concentration of power. And the power and the economy are so connected in order to to uh, secure their market. However, um, the China and Russia still maintain the separation of the economy and the politics uh, in, uh, uh, to make the much deeper uh, uh, integration of the uh, economy, the Western economy into their economy. And therefore, uh, <clears throat> the, this has been, uh, there, there was a, a sort of an understanding that you know, uh, even China and Russia, even though we, we have different uh, political views and uh, are potentially, you know, uh, hostile to each other, but still, you know, we can invest in, Ch in China and we can make profit out of it. We can depend on Russia for the energy and we can, you know, we can uh, fulfill our needs for, for so that... You know, there was a there was a concept of the separation of the politics and the economy. Uh, you know, in in Korean, there was an understanding that security, U.S. Uh, economy, China. Or in Japan, there was a you know a politics, cold economy, heated. You know, the, these kind of uh, you know words come out of assumption that you, you know you can separate the economy uh, from uh, from politics. But in fact, uh, you know, what uh, uh, Nitin uh, uh, explained was basically a fusion of the politics and, and the economy. China, Russia is clearly using the uh, economy as a weapon, economy as a leverage to impose their ideas, the values, their political objectives, and 
you know, uh, it happened in in on Japan in 2010 when you know uh, uh, Japan Japanese Coast Guard has arrested the the, the captain of the fish uh, fishing boat uh, in around the Senkaku Islands, and then China has stopped exporting uh, rare earth mineral. Um, with, in order to, you know, press Japan to release the, the, the captain. So this was basically the understanding that, uh, you know, China is using this economic statecraft or economic coercion by understand, with an understanding that, you know, the Western countries are fully dependent on the uh, Chinese economy, particularly the, the rare earth mineral and the many other things in, you know, Japan. Uh, Japan, U.S., and, and China are all integrated into the uh, global supply chain. And on the other hand, the Trump administration, as well as the Biden administration, is using the economic leverage to impose uh, some sort of conditions on China. For example, the uh, Chip Press Act or the uh, Uyghur uh, uh, Forced Labor Protection Act, or, you know, there are various you know, uh, political, legal tools to um, to use the economy as the leverage to to uh, to enforce some s sort of a values and policies against China. So I think this is the time that we are now uh, seeing the economy and the politics are fused together, and this is the future of the liberal international order. We need to assume that the rule-based order has to be constructed upon the understanding that the economy and, and, and the economy and the politics cannot be separated, and we need to control how to exercise such power uh, by, the, by the rules. And, and uh, without that, we can't really go back to the 10 years before and, you know, coming back to this uh, um, uh, implementation of the WTO rules because WTO doesn't work um, since, and not because China, but because America. Americans never, you know, because the Trump administration didn't appoint the uh, uh, members of the appellate court, then appellate body, then, uh, you know, we can't expect the, the WTO to play a role to impose the uh, rule-based order. So I think the future is very dim and very uh, murky. Um, it's, it's really hard to, uh, to predict what's going to happen, but I think what we need to think for the future of the liberal international order is based on this idea of the future of the politics and the economy. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Suzuki-san, uh, for uh, covering another important topic, that is the link between economic issues with uh, security issues. So there are so many interlinks, interrelations, and it's always very difficult to understand international relations in the Indo-Pacific as a whole, because it is a quite fluid uh, concept. And also, there are so many actors in it. Uh, they have different strategies, but at the same time, uh, we now realize the importance, much more than before, on the connection between economic issues with uh, these uh, security issues. So that's why I feel that we have different relationship with China. We have a very deep trade relationship with China, but at the same time, we have a different kind of relationship, security relationship with China. But as a whole, we need to really uh, think this in a uh, in a much more integrated way. Uh, actually, uh, we don't have uh, project members in it uh, online. Uh, that's why if uh, we have some, uh, we like to collect a few questions online uh, from, from uh, who uh, participate virtually. If you have some questions, I think that uh, there are some students who are participating online. So if you have some questions, please uh, uh, write your question by using a Q&A function, if you have some. But until then, uh, if, uh, Hans, you have some uh, uh, thought upon the uh, talks of previous panelists. Uh, Hans, do you have any comments or uh, uh, any kind of uh, uh, idea or wisdom upon the discussion which you have been listening to. Thank you. Um, 
and yeah, as you said, there are so many different aspects to this. It's difficult to know um, what to focus on. Um, I guess maybe two things that I found particularly interesting, um, again, to try to bring out some of the sort of complexity here, but I think some of the difficult dilemmas that, that, that we face. Um, so first of all, I was very struck by, um, by what Suzuki-san was, was saying about um, <clears throat> economic security and the sort of evolution of the economic order. Um, and I just want to sort of spell out in a way, um, at least the way I think about this, um, which is that in a sense, what we're dealing with here, I think, um, is, a kind of, is a kind of liberal overreach that we're now having to kind of correct. Um, and, and again, this sort of, to me, this illustrates the complexity of the concept of the liberal international order and the, the sense in which it's liberal because it's liberal in sort of multiple different senses and there is a certain kind of tension between them. And so the way I understand what Suzuki-san is saying, I think this is absolutely right. And it's, it's, a, it's a dilemma that not just Japan is facing, but everybody is kind of facing, I think. Um, Japan, Japan has maybe just gone a little bit further in sort of thinking this through or spelling this out. But I think what Suzuki-san is saying is that in a sense, we need to become less liberal in economic terms <laughs> in order to maintain our liberalism in political terms, mm -hmm. right? So there's a kind of a tension between the economic liberalism of the order, um, which is around free trade, as Suzuki-san said, and the political liberalism of the order, which I mentioned at the beginning, is around democracy. Mm -hmm. So I think the shift that we're seeing on economic policy across, you know, um, countries is the sense that we've gone too far with our economic liberalism, mm -hmm. and that's undermined political liberalism. And now we need to refocus on political liberalism, and that involves dialing back economic liberalism. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that sort of illustrates the complexities and the, the kind of tensions here. But this then also brings me to my second point I wanted to make, which is which brings me to France and, and what Celine said, because I think it's very interesting um, how, you know, you, you, what you said, Suzuki-san, about Japan in the 1980s. I think this is my understanding, too. Uh, I know Japan much less well than you do, but but my understanding as 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 you said, was that Japan sort of essentially made concessions to the United States for security reasons, right? It made concessions on the economic side. I'm thinking here of, you know, voluntary export restraints and so on, um, because the United States was a political ally and it depended on the United States for its security. What I think is so fascinating about Europeans is that they refuse actually to think in that way, even now. And I think the French strategy that Celine outlined is kind of an illustration of this, um, that it's not as if Europeans are saying, well, um, because um, we depend on the United States for security, we have to make concessions in other areas, particularly in economic, uh, in economic policy. On the contrary, it seems to me as if Europeans want to have it both ways. They want to continue to depend on the United States for their security, and at the same time, stand up to the United States on economic questions. And I think the best example of this was the CAI, the China Investment Agreement that Angela Merkel, who I think embodies this approach more than anybody else, tried to push through, right? You know, so in other words, Europeans want to have their cake and eat it, as we say in Britain. Now, France is in a slightly different position because I think France is more genuinely committed to the idea of an independent Europe that doesn't depend on the United States for its security. And as a nuclear power, it, I think uniquely can do that. Um, but, you know, the German view is very clearly, we will continue to depend on the United States for our security, but at the same time, we want to be able to do our own thing on economic policy and not be pushed around by the United States. And that, you know, to the extent that the US does make demands of us on the economic side, that's a violation of European sovereignty. Um, that I think is 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 you know is a really problematic uh, kind of position um, that um, that some Europeans have, and and that just finally then brings me to this question, which I'd love to sort of push Celine a little bit more on this question of you know the, the very interesting point you, you raised, Celine, about you know well how is the French position actually different from the Chinese position in relation to a multipolar order? 
I understand that, um, you know, France, you know, is not equidistant between China and the United States, that it's more aligned with the United States than it is with China. I understand that. But in terms of its vision of a multipolar order, I don't quite see how it is different from the Chinese vision, actually. As you pointed out, France, like China, doesn't want actually a, um, you know, hegemonic US order. It wants a, a multipolar order. And this is also the reason why China was very supportive of the idea of European strategic autonomy. China has always quite wanted Europe to be a separate actor, an independent actor from the United States, um, so that China doesn't face a kind of united West. Um, and, um, and I can't quite see how the French position is actually any different from the Chinese position in terms of what you described as the kind of external, you know, not the internal question of democracy, but the external question of um, how states interact um, with each other. It seems to me that actually the French position is, is, is pretty close to the Chinese position, or at least I can't quite see the difference between them. So maybe you could explain that a little bit more. Well, thank you very much indeed, Hans, uh, for your brilliant, uh, insightful comment as always. And uh, before moving on to Suzuki-san's closing remarks, maybe we need to listen to Celine's reaction <laughs> to how French position is similar to China's position or well. whether it is wrong <laughs> to assume that. Please. Well, no. <laughs> I, no, I don't think. I, I, as I said, I think uh, we have to be very careful with words and terminology and what we put behind that. I mean, uh, the, um, the Chinese talk also about uh, human rights, they talk about uh, democracy, they talk about multilateralism, but certainly they don't put the same things that we do behind that. So I think the, the way uh, France is seeing uh, multipolarity is of course um, not um, supporting any hegemon, be it uh, China nor the US, uh, because we see uh, the US-China rivalry now being very uh, destabilizing in a way, very disruptive. So we think that uh, you know middle power could come together and uh, and um, support uh, actually um, a rules-based order in this sense. Um, but maybe uh, China has an, another view. You know, and want to to make a, a multipolar world more around its own kind of. Of, of values and, uh, and interest and, uh, and gather um, a kind of, of, of um, group of countries that might not uh, be um, seen as equal to, to China, but be under its influence, you know. So I think uh, in this way, um, that's why uh, France is advocating very much on multipolarity and true multilateralism and not um, like a kind of multi bipolarity or, or trying to have an influence on, uh, on a group of, of country. So I think that that would be the, the, the main difference that I, uh, that I see. Well, thank you very much, Celine, uh, for answering to this very difficult question. But uh, well, time is running up, unfortunately, and uh, I apologize that I, we don't have time to ask both Luis and uh, Nathan. And thank you very much indeed for you all for participating uh, this event, this event until the end. Thank you very much indeed.